our contributions in education will be our legacy in this industry. Whether it's through live education or maybe through social media, we're always trying to make a personal connection with you, the learner. At FanVia, we believe our smile is our business card and our personality is our logo. And how we make people feel after you experience our education and tools is our trademark. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us, my friends, and be a part of the Sandia community. Welcome to Transformation Tuesday. It's a beautiful fall morning here in Southern Oregon, and we're so happy to have you all here with us. Thank you for joining us. We've got a great, great morning of education with our good friend Marquetta Breslin. You guys, she was telling me a little bit about what she's going to share with you. Mind already blown, and we just talked for like five minutes, so get ready for that. Before we do that, though, let's talk just a little bit about this week coming up. Actually, I guess there's just one more event after this one, but super important to share with you. Tomorrow, we've got Wellness Wednesday. We have our friend Blake Reed Evans. He's a Red Can artist and a social media coach. What's going to be fantastic about what he's going to share with us, though, is how to utilize social media in a way that feels authentic and and, and in something that feels um connected to us personally, but is also effective for connecting with clients and just showing who we truly are. So it's going to be a great episode. We're super excited about that. Um, lots coming up too with Black Friday sales. So please stay tuned for that. We know that you're um, out there working and, you know, doing great hair. So we want to make sure that you have the tools you need. So we're going to continue to supply you with great prices and great deals through uh, next or the next few weeks, actually. <laughs> I don't even remember what week it is at this point. So um, Let's um let's get right into the education because Marquetta has so much to share with you. I don't want to waste too much time. So everyone, um, please put your hands together. Say welcome, Marquetta, in the chat. Let's bring her on. Hi, Marquetta. Good morning. Hi. How are you? I don't even know what week it is either, Andrew. I don't know anymore. Is it November? December? Is it Christmas yet? <laughs> I don't know. It's all running together at this point. I've, I've seen Christmas decorations starting to come out, and I'm like, yeah. okay, yeah, summer came and went. What happened? <laughs> this year has been a blur. It's been an interesting year, that's for sure. Yeah. So, Marquetta, <laughs> I know we're going to talk about wigs today. Can yeah. you tell them a little bit about your background with, um, I think it's very kind of special how you got into wigs. Absolutely. And you have such a passion for it. Yes, yes, yes. So years ago, actually back in 2006, I was just thinking about this. Actually, I was going to share this story. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, Andrew, let me just say thank you to you and Sam and the entire team for having me back on the show. It's I, I appreciate it. You guys are amazing. So thank you for having me back on the show. We love um, when it comes to wigs and how I got into wigs, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2006. I was active duty Air Force. Um, so I was driving home for lunch. My best friend was visiting and I was driving home for lunch and I remember getting the phone call. Um, and she said, you know, I've been diagnosed with cancer. They said it's stage two and I was just devastated. I didn't, because you always think at that moment, not me or not my family. And it was my mom who was one of the closest people to me at that moment. So I went through all of the emotions and I was crying and I, I even I was supposed to deploy that year and I didn't even deploy that year. My supervisor didn't send me over there because of what was going on with my mom. So um, it was a, a tough time for for me personally because I have such a close relationship with my mom. 
And I remember going to her with her to her doctor's appointment. And she said, um, she asked the doctor, she said, am I going to lose my hair when I go through chemotherapy? And, you know, sure enough, the doctor explained to us that not all chemotherapy takes out your hair, but this particular type that mom needed to be on and needed to be a little bit more aggressive. So she lost every bit of her hair, brows, lashes, everything. Um, and so even in the midst of her losing her hair, my mom was a very, very, very strong individual. She did not care. Even though she asked, she said she didn't care because she was just happy to be alive. Um, but the thing that bothered me with her hair loss is the wigs <laughs> that she was wearing because they were some of the most unflattering wigs ever. Um, one of the hardest things for back, especially back then, one of the hardest things for for her to find were wigs that suited her and wigs that fit her and look natural. So I remember uh, one day I said, mom, let me just, let me make you a wig. Let me make you the type of wig that they use in television and film. It's gonna look like it's coming out of your sky. I mean, I sold her this big idea and didn't even know how to do it myself. <laughs> I knew I knew what to do, but I didn't know how. I didn't even know where to go to find the resources. So once she agreed, I think she just agreed to, so I could stop talking about it. But once she agreed, I went back to and put on my thinking cap and there was not a lot of information at all. I had no idea that this was something that um, originated over in Europe. In fact, back in 1805, a man uh, by the name of, oh, I'm going to butcher his name, um, not on purpose though, but his name was Laguette Le and he was a hairdresser. He invented the first flesh colored hairnet for lace wigs. And then later on, there was a man uh, who invented the knotting foundation uh, with the gauze needle. So I didn't know any of that then. I know it now, but didn't know it then. So I had to keep trying to figure out a way to make this wig for my mom. And so with through trial and error, what ended up happening was I developed my own method for making lace wigs. Later on, I found out that <laughs> there's there's multiple different ways of doing this, but I didn't know that at the time. So uh, in the process, I almost gave up and almost just stopped doing it altogether because it was a very difficult process for me to figure out. But once I did, and I made my mom her first wig and saw how it totally, in a moment, it totally changed her perception about how she was feeling about herself and what she was feeling and she didn't have to look like what she was going through. So when I saw this and I saw the change it made in my mom, I said, okay, I have to figure out a way to, to be able to scale this so that other hairstylists and beauty professionals can do this for other women and men who are suffering from permanent hair loss or hair loss due to chemotherapy. And that's when by this time um, it had been, she had, been going through chemotherapy. She was on the other side of it, but her hair still hadn't grown back yet. And so my husband and I put our heads together and I developed the very first lace wig training system all the way back in 2006 or 2007. And that's when I started teaching and educating on my wig making process to help people who suffer from hair loss, permanent hair loss, uh, alopecia, or for the everyday woman that just wants to change it up. So it was um, a very grueling process in the beginning, but very rewarding. It's, wigs have a special place in my heart because of my mom. Yeah, what an incredible story. And thank you so much for sharing that because that's pretty hard opening to, to share something like that with us. So thank you for that gift. Oh, that's you're really welcome. Nice. But this is, the, I think this is so important to recognize that you didn't just create a product because you're like, oh, hey, here's a gap in the industry. I could make some money. Like you have such a heart uh, connection and a heartfelt passion for this, that that's what makes you uh, so, I mean, I'll use the word prolific at this. Oh, I mean, you've had hundreds you. and hundreds of thousands of people that have learned how to do this you know, through your online courses, through your hands-on courses. So, um, you know, that gift from the heart, you, you spread that so far. So 
So Thank beautiful. You. Thank you so much. You know, I I always say that when we if we have a gift, if we have something that we can share with other people, it is our duty to be able to do that because other people's destinies are tied to us and what we do. So I I'm very um it's it, education is very important to me and when it especially when it comes to things like this. And I always say to people, uh, don't just stop at one place when you're learning something, learn from other people. Um, so, oh, wow, Myra, I, that's that's unfortunately such a common thing that I hear all the time with people who are going through, um, you know, grieving with parents that have gone through cancer. So I understand exactly what that's like. And um, it's one of the most rewarding things to see even that little glimmer of hope or to see someone's perception change in that moment. They feel good about themselves. You shouldn't have to look like what you're going through. So that was uh, the driving force behind me creating that system and getting into wigs. I built that entire thing based off of my mom's experience with, with wigs. And later on, um, she ended up passing away in 2016. She battled for 10 years. She passed away the day after Mother's Day in 2016. She uh, fought long and hard. And um, I'm just thankful that my mom is at peace. So I am, uh, I'm going to get right into this getting into wig work if that's okay with you andrew yeah rocket I and mean, i know you have so much content for us and like i said just a little bit you already shared is so powerful so we're super Thank excited you. take it away all right let's do this so the first thing i want to talk about is getting into wig work because one of the things that i wish i had more of when i was in cosmetology school was i wish the section on wigs was bigger because we would we would have been thoroughly and well prepared when we came out of cosmetology school to go into the cos cosmetology field and potentially um just work with wigs or or, or have a, a background of solid knowledge of working with wigs. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Hopefully that changes one day. But a lot of people ask me, how do I even start getting into wig work? And the first thing you have to, to think is, what exactly is it that I want to do with wigs? Because there's so many different things that you can do with wigs. You can work with cancer patients. You can work with people who suffer from alopecia. You can work in television and film. You can just work with wigs behind the chair with women who just women and men who just want to wear wigs for whatever reason or toppers. If you're a barber, you can work with toppers. There's so many different things that you can do. So first thinking about from a from a holistic standpoint, okay, there's all these different things that I can do with hair pieces and wigs. What is it that I would prefer to do? And sometimes, you know what, you may not even know until you start trying, but I always say that education is key. If you know that you want to do anything at all with wigs, start finding an educator that you trust that has a, a, a reputable background that can teach you about the skill. I would say start there. And then after you start with the education and you start getting a little bit of a foundational knowledge about wigs, what wigs are, how they're used and all of that stuff, then you can hone in on exactly what it is you want to do with wigs, whether it's working in television and film, if it's working um, just with the everyday woman, if it's working with just male toppers or if it's working with insurance companies for people who suffer from permanent hair loss. Um, and then after that, I would say the biggest, the biggest thing that people miss out on is they'll attend a class or they'll, they'll read a couple books and get education, but they do nothing with it. The biggest, that's the biggest mistake that you can make because practice makes permanent. The more you practice whatever it is you want to do, the better you're going to get at it and the more you'll be able to offer to your clients. This is the easy part is the education and figuring out what you want to do. The hardest part for people is really pursuing that and practicing it and not putting it down. So you just got to, you, that's one of the biggest things with this wig world is making sure that you have proper education and making sure that 
Whatever it is you want to do, you practice that thing. Because if you don't practice, that's going to be very, very, very difficult for you to excel in whatever part of that industry you want. I can tell you so many horror stories. Okay, I'll share just one. So (laughs) I had a young lady years ago. I used to have a brick and mortar salon in Charleston, actually Somerville, South Carolina. It's the city right next to Charleston. And this just speaks on the importance of education. There was a young lady who came to my salon because she had went to another salon to order a lace wig. Uh, She got this wig and she said, it just doesn't fit. And the stylist doesn't really know how to help me. So can you help me? So she brings the wig into the salon and it's way too big. Her hair is, I mean, it's, it's off by at least an inch and a half all the way around. And I was sitting there and I was trying to figure out how in the world it would be off that by that much. And so I started to ask questions. And one of the first questions I asked is, how was your hair prepared when she took your measurements for the wig? And she said, well, when she took my measurements, I had a full, I had extensions, I had a full sew in. And I said, oh, I said, okay, well, this makes sense. And the the first thing I did was you, I never talk negatively about another professional ever. I don't do that in business. So that was the first thing. Number one, I said, okay, well, when she, <laughs> yes, because you know, it's, it's easy to say, oh, what was she thinking? What was she doing? Da, 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 da. I don't do that. All right. So the first thing I did was said, okay, Let me just explain to you a little bit more about how this process goes. And I explained to her that when you take measurements for a wig or when you do a head, a head mold or head wrap, the hair needs to be prepared the same way throughout the entire wig making process. And when this young lady is going to wear this wig, she's not going to wear the wig with the extensions in. She's not going to put them on top of the extensions. So you don't want to do that. And my point in sharing this story is there was a lack of education with that stylist. Instead of uh, going a little bit deeper and finding out the proper way to take measurements or the proper way to handle a client that has a, a full head of extensions in, she didn't understand those things because she didn't have proper education. So that's why it's so important. Getting into wig work is really And anything you're going to do in the beauty industry, education is key. So never forget that. And then I'm just going to hammer that point in a little bit more with making sure that when you do get start educating yourself is get education from multiple sources. Don't just stop with one thing. Read books, watch YouTube videos, uh, go to different classes. Don't stop at just one thing or one person. All right, so now let's move on to the different types of wigs. This is when it's going to get really, really fun and very, very interesting because I have some props. I'm so excited. Can you tell? (laughs) So, all right, so I'm going to break down the three different types of wigs or three different types of wigs. Number one is uh, bespoke wigs. These wigs, you might hear somebody say, uh, I want to order a bespoke wig or I'm going to commission somebody to make me a wig. That is bespoke means custom made. That means from the entire, from the start all the way to the finish, you are getting a handmade custom, truly custom piece. That means your your head mold, which in uh, over in Europe, they call it the bubble. All right. That's when the client sits down in the chair. They take the plastic wrap and the seller tape or scotch tape, whatever you decide to use, depending on where you were educated, uh, they make a mold of your head. And then there's a whole nother process that goes in with the head mold and padding out the wig block and all of that stuff. All right. So that process is done. And then from start to finish, I have a prop right here. Hopefully I don't knock everything down when I grab this, but this right here is a bespoke wig that's in the process of being made. This is actually a wig for my daughter and this is a mold of her head. Okay. And then there is a cap, which is the foundation that's being made from scratch with multiple pieces of lace. So you have here your nape band. Okay. And then you have another piece of lace here and then you have your third panel of lace. And then this right here from here, all the way over and in this parted area is where 
her part is going to be. So, so can yes. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. So because I'm completely new to this. So um, <laughs> you start out by creating sort of like a plastic sh shell almost. Yes. So was there's, I noticed there was some stuff underneath the plastic. Is that to kind of like fill in the shape? Yes, that is correct. So what's underneath this plastic, you see, it looks like tissue because it's yeah. paper. And that was what, what was what, that is what we use to pad out the block. So padding it out means that you're filling in all of the empty space to maintain the shape of that person's head. Because if you alter the shape in any way, you're altering the fit of the wig. So you have to pad it out so that it maintains the shape of that person's head. And that's when you would build the foundation. Now, some people build foundations on wooden wig blocks. Uh, and some pe there's multiple different ways to do it. Traditionally, they're built on a wooden wig block where it is a heavy piece of wood and then there's bracings and it's a long process to do it that way. But th this is just one of many different ways. You can, um, you can make caps in so many different ways. There is no one way to do this. That's what I love about wig making is that you can get super creative and make so many different things with just the skill. All right. So that's bespoke wigs, fully custom made from start to finish. The entire thing is hand tied. Um, in the U.S., we call it ventilating, which is how you're tying the hair onto the tiny little holes in the lace. In the U.K. and in Europe, they call it knotting. All right. So they say knot the hair. We say ventilate the hair. It's all the same thing. All right. So that's your bespoke wigs. Then you have your manufactured or mass produced wigs. And these are wigs that are typically made in a factory. Um, and you have different types of manufactured and mass produced wigs as well. So I'm going to get into that in a minute. And then you have your semi custom pieces. And those are pieces that uh, you can purchase from like, let's say you purchase a wig from a beauty supply store and it's not all the way what you want it to be. You can refront a wig, meaning you can cut off their lace and all of the stuff that they have, if it's a lace front wig and you can add your own to make it semi-custom. This is what they do a lot in, or some, I'll say some, in television and film when they have to do something really, really quickly or some even sometimes in theater. They will work with a piece that has already been manufactured, but they'll go in and customize whatever that piece is. Um, let me grab another, here, I'll grab this one. Here is an example of a piece that is going to be um, modified or semi-custom. So this is a lace front wig. And my daughter's been working on this piece. What we've done is we've used some good old nair that you would use to remove hair um, from your legs or from your arms or whatever. And we've used nair to remove the hair in the areas that we don't want. And then we're going back in and we're hand tying our own knots. Because what you'll find with um, manufactured wigs and factory wigs are the knots look manufactured. They don't look like they're growing out of the scalp. It doesn't look natural. So in order to fix that, we'll just take a piece that has been manufactured, remove the hair in certain areas, and then go back and hand tie knots in the areas that we want uh, that's going to be exposed to the naked eye. All right, that's a that's a part of either revamping or uh, <laughs> semi custom pieces. <laughs> this is amazing. So again, kind of just totally um, newbie. So what is the purpose of the lace front? Okay, so the lace front is for people who, let's say um, I have hair loss around my edges. This whole part of my hair is gone. A lace front is going to be a piece of lace that goes across the front with maybe some wefts in the back, which is what this is. So in the back of this wig are wefts. I don't know if you can see that. So in the back of this wig are wefts and then the whole front of this wig is lace. So that's why it's called a lace front wig because the front is lace. And that's what 
you're going to use for your customers, or let's just say your customer has hair, but they want to be able to pull it back. A lace front wig will enable you to do that. It will enable you to pull the hair off of the face and, and be able to wear it in a low ponytail. All right. You can still have, um, you can have lace in the front and a small piece of lace at the nape to be able to pull it into a little bit of a higher ponytail. So you can get very creative with some of these pieces. And how, how do you get the lace to blend with the skin? So you can have, so there's different types. And by the way, if this is not the direction you want to go, oh, you no. can tell me to shut up. <laughs> no, this is great. This is great. So there's multiple types of adhesives. So you have your medical grade adhesives, um, and then you have uh, tapes that you can use, or some people just wear glueless wigs, meaning they don't want, they don't necessarily, for whatever reason, want to be able to use adhesive. And with that, that's when you would go to your bespoke wigs, your custom made wigs that's made to fit that individual and that individual only. Um, that's going to be so custom that when they put it on, they don't have to glue it down. They may have to have an elastic band to hold on to hold it, you know, hold it on the head, but they don't have to use any adhesives or anything like that. But that's how um, the lace, you get the lace to stay on the head is either by you can use combs. Sometimes you can use hairpins, depending on the situation. We just did a big shoot um, for my hairline that's launching and nobody's wig was glued down. Actually, I think maybe one or two wigs were adhered, um, but that was only because we needed them to be because they were short wigs. So it's multiple different ways that you can do this. Um, but yeah, this is a wig that's going to be semi-custom once it's done. All of this right here will be hand tied by us as well as the hairline because that you can, I don't think you guys will be able to see the difference here, but it is a distinct difference between a, a knot that's mass produced and something that you tie on your own. The difference is unreal. And I'm assuming uh, the price difference between taking something that's been kind of pre-manufactured and mm -hmm. just customizing that pre-manufactured wig mm -hmm. would be uh, still a significant savings over having something that's fully bespoke. Absolutely. The price difference for a bespoke wig, you can go upwards of five to seven, eight thousand dollars sometimes. Wow. Depending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it, all, it just all depends on where you're getting it made. Um, the the, the the bigger reputation for the company, the more you're going to pay typically. But it is, a, it is a very long process. It can take a couple of weeks to go from start to finish for a bespoke wig. Mm -hmm. um, the knotting in and of itself for a bespoke wig, around 35 to 70, up to 70 hours, sometimes more, mm -hmm. depending on the type of lace. And that's the other thing with these um, some of these semi custom pieces and custom pieces is you have different types of lace that you use. So um, you have your regular film lace. I'm just speaking of lace that's going in the front. So you have base lace and film lace. Your base lace used to be called opera lace, and that's the lace that has the bigger holes that's going to be used throughout the crown or anywhere that the naked eye is not going to see. So typically in the middle of the wig, you can use a lace with bigger holes. Then you have your lace with the smaller holes. That's called your film lace and your HD lace. Nine times out of 10, film lace can be used in the place of HD lace because HD lace is so fragile and so thin that if you don't have experience working with HD lace, it can be very difficult to work with. Um, in television and film, if someone is working with H true HD lace, that lace has to be folded and doubled and only that front quarter of an inch uh, doesn't have that folded seam and it's not doubled because that's what's going to be exposed to the camera. But a lot of people don't realize that Everybody talks about HD lace, but really, you don't really need HD lace. You can do what you need to do with film lace because it's so thin and so fragile in and of itself that it's going to disappear when it's put up against the skin. Cool. So does HD mean high definition? Is that yep. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, it um, means 
We have a couple questions from from oh, the hey. audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whitney is asking for clients with alopecia, is there a specific lace that would need to be used for that type of client? Film lace, either film lace or a, a coated film lace. Now, you have lace, some lace that has a coating on it. And I used to know um, what it was coated with, but I t it's, I'm sure it'll come back to me before we're done here. But uh, that particular type of lace, uh, there's a company, the only company that I deal with when I'm ordering lace is uh, called Atelier Bossy. And Mr. Bossy makes, he comes up with these amazing ideas and makes these amazing different types of lace. And um, you can purchase a coated, if you're making a lace wig from scratch, a coated film lace or just a regular film lace will work just fine. It's soft. Um, it's not uncomfortable to the skin. And that will probably do you just fine. But as I always say, each individual is different. So you may find that for that particular client, they need uh, HD lace for whatever reason. So you just have to go based on uh, your client. But I would say in most cases, a film lace is going to be totally, totally fine. Totally fine. Awesome. And then um, there was a question from Michelle Lynn. She's asking, would you still bleach not after your ventilation? No. Um, well, I say that, but I'm trying to find a piece. This is not a very good example because this, this hair is blonde. So for those that don't know, when you purchase a wig from a manufacturer, sometimes those knots are so dark because they're double split knots. Sometimes they're so dark that you have to bleach them in order to get them to blend in with the skin. And so what you do is you take a lace closure or a lace frontal and you would apply bleach to the underside of the wig to lift the pigments out of that color to get it to blend in with the color of the skin. It's amazing. It works. But when you hand tie knots, I'm going to try to see. You see the difference. You can probably barely see the difference. But over here on this side, these are manufactured knots. And what you see right here in the middle are knots that my daughter tied. The point in bleaching knots is to allow that uh, hair, those knots to blend in with the skin. But when you hand tie and you're hand tying one to two hairs in every hole, it is very difficult to see that knot. So you, in most cases, you don't even have to bleach knots if you hand tie the knots yourself. You can, but you don't have to. Um, there are instances though, where even though you've hand tied those knots, that hair is so dark that you can still see tiny little dots. In that case, then yes, you could still bleach the knots. But in most cases, you don't have to when you're hand tying yourself. Beautiful. And Gwendolyn was asking, is film lace the same as transparent lace? Yeah. So the thing with some of these terminologies is the, the, the real terms are opera lace, base lace, and film lace, and HD lace. Transparent lace is the same thing as a film lace or an HD lace. It's just a terminology that um, was developed, I'll say, in most likely over in Asia where they're mass produced the most. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's the same. It's pretty much the same thing. But there is a difference between the lace that you can get out of Asia and the lace that you import from uh, like a Mr. Bossy or something like that. The, dip, the type, the way it's made is different. It's not the same type of material. So it can feel a little bit... Um, it will feel a lot different actually. And the way it melts into the skin will be totally different as well. And are most, most wigs, are they a hundred percent human hair? Yes. Oh, that's a great question. So every wig that I have here is 100% human hair. Uh, there are synthetic wigs. In fact, one of my students specializes in making synthetic bespoke wigs. Um, but So you can have a, fully bespoke wig or purchase a wig that was made out of synthetic hair, but 90, I'll say 90 to 95% of the time, what you're working with is going to be human hair. Uh, that's what's going to be either something like this or something like this. It's just different grades of human hair. 
and I, I don't want to get you off track, but no, no, you're fine. <laughs> as, as far as just sourcing of materials, one of the things that we found a lot about when we started to work with Pivot Point mm -hmm. is how many different sources of human hair there are and how some are terrible, like scary. So can you talk to that a bit? Absolutely. So there, you're, you guys are right. You're right. There's multiple different places that you can source hair from. I will say this. Earlier this year, pre-COVID, I uh, traveled over to India and um, I wanted to go over there and see for myself exactly how hair is handled and how hair is uh, just how the whole industry works. And one of the things I found is number one, there are thousands of people per day um, in India who go to the temple, to go to the multiple different temples um, to donate their hair. And they're not just donating their hair. What they're doing is it's uh, something that they do as a religious sacrifice. It's a religious thing. And so the hair is, they go up to the temple, the heads are shaved, um, and then they take this hair and they put it in these massive piles. And um, I went to Temple Town. It's a city called Tirupati. And in Tirupati, that's where they have the most temples in all of India. So they call that the hair Mecca. And so in Temple Town, I went to visit a factory there. When I went into this factory, there were huge, massive bags of hair everywhere. And so from that, um, you have different multiple factories in India who bid on the hair that is donated um, at the temples. They used to burn the hair many, 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 many years ago. They used to burn it. And then they started auctioning off the hair to different people in India who wanted to manufacture the hair to be sold to different countries. Um, once that was done and they started to multiple different uh, factories started popping up all over India, then that's when they started uh, sourcing hair for to sell to America and all of these other countries. Well, one particular factory I went in had an entire three store facility dedicated to just processing hair to be sold to China, all right? This hair was sold by the tons, tons per week. Once it gets to China, they have multiple different machines that will turn the cuticles to make all of the cuticles in the same direction, and then it goes through a processing from there. So this is the hair that could not be used. This particular manufacturer did not want to use in India because it had been processed. So that hair has already been processed by the donor. So meaning they could have colored the hair or put some sort of chemical in it. All right, so that hair is already, um, the quality, I'll say the quality goes from here to here, just from what the donor did to it. And then it's it's processed and they put it in these, um, they straighten it, I'll say. They hackle the hair, they straighten it, they get it all together in the same lengths. And then they bundle it all up in these huge bundles. It's probably about that big around. And then that hair goes into, it's sorted by length and by color. And then that's what's purchased to be sent over to China. And once it gets to China, it goes through a rigorous process depending on the quality of it once it gets there. Once it gets to China, it is then sorted by length, color, and quality. And then some of it, they just turn the cuticle, uh, strip the, sometimes they strip the cuticle or sometimes they just turn the, the all the cuticles unidirectional, so all in the same direction because if cuticles are mismatched, the hair will mat. All right, so once that's done and they decide to turn all the cuticles, then they process that hair just as it is. They may throw a silicone coating on it to maintain the shine and then that's sold. And so over in China, they have multiple different grades of hair. So they rate it by, I think 11A and I don't know their grading system because I, I, don't, um, I don't order hair that often from China almost never. Um, but you do have some companies in China that has some amazing quality hair. 
Don't get me wrong by what I'm saying. Um, they still have some amazing quality here, but then you do have some vendors and not just in China, all over the world that just don't have quality hair for whatever reason. The way they process the hair is just not good. But then you have other companies and other people who have amazing quality hair. They're very strict in the process and how they select the hair and how they choose the hair they're going to work with in that if it has an ounce of chemicals in it, they will not use it. They put it in a different category to be sold to other countries. And it's not just China. Angora, they send it all over uh, depending on who wants whatever particular hair they're dealing with, uh, depending on what has been done to it. And it doesn't mean that it's not good quality because some of it, even though it has been colored before, is still amazing quality. The hair is very strong. It just has been color treated. So a lot of these factories over in India don't want to deal with anything that has ever have had a chemical on it before. So that's why they, they sell it to other these other factories from around the world. And you actually are going to have your own, Is are they ready yet or <sighs> your own wigs? So close. So close. <laughs> so close. Yes, I'm hoping that uh, by the end of the year, we will be launched, I'm hoping. Awesome. And are those gonna be completed wigs or can they actually purchase hair from you or? It will be um, weft, so it will be hair. It will be bulk hair for wig makers. It will be full wigs and all of that stuff. Lace, uh, full lace wigs, lace closure wigs and um, bulk hair as well, selling closures also and frontals. So it's going to be a full blown ordeal. I'm excited. Awesome. So you can actually be a reliable vendor for um, the hair that they need. Yes, yes, yes. That's so awesome. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to let you take it wherever you're at as I keep getting you off track. No, I love the questions. I love it. I love it. So, I, and right. actually, sorry, before you do, yes. because it's been asked quite a few times, sure. tell them about your your program real quick, because I, I've had multiple people ask about if you have online education. So Yes, yes. So I have... Um, a class called the Lace Wig Training System. And it's an online class. It used to be a physical DVD set, but once everything went digital, we followed. So now it's a completely digital course. Um, it only launches once a year. We launched it already this year. And starting in December, we're completely refilming the entire course from scratch. It's gonna launch again in 2021, early 2021. Um, so we're really excited about that. My legacy system, which is the first system that I ever created um, with my mom as my model, that system is always available on the website. It is um, a fully online system and it's always it's always there on the website, uh, markwetabresin.com. Um, but the classes are the online classes are amazing, but I also do hands on classes. I have a class coming up here in Vegas in December. It's going to be the 14th and 15th of December. A two day hands on class. We practice social distancing. Everybody wears the mask. Um, I keep the classes small so that I can make sure that each individual gets hands on attention. Um, but yeah, that's everything that I'm talking about uh, now in terms of classes and online classes can be found on my website. Uh, education, as you know, as you've heard me talk about, is very, very, very important to me and making sure that I have something available for people to be able to uh, learn this process is extremely important. At one point, I will say this, at one point, wig making was a dying art. It was something that I was praying, hoping and praying did not just completely fall off the face of the earth <laughs> and everything was would be outsourced and manufactured, but now, um, I, I don't I don't think it's a, die, a dying art anymore. It's something that um, a lot more people are getting into and interested in. And it's amazing to see all of these new wig makers popping up all over the world. Uh, it's just really, truly amazing. So, all right. 
I'm going to move on to uh, let's talk a little bit deeper because I talked a lot about the semi custom and the bespoke wigs. So I want to talk a little bit more about these manufactured and mass produced pieces. Um, so one of the one of the terms that's used in the wig making community is a hard front wig. I'll say that. And that wig, a hard front wig is a wig that has no lace anywhere in sight. Um, it's totally made from wefts. And these are the, the typical wigs that you buy out of like a costume store or a beauty supply store. The beauty in having this skill is that you can take a hard front wig and, and, and modify it and make it a lace front wig or make it whatever you want to make it. So that's one of the, um, that's one term that a lot of people may hear, but not necessarily understand what it is. So I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. All right. The next type of wig is going to be that can be fully manufactured is a full lace wig. Now I have a full lace wig right here. It's a short wig that we used for a shoot. All right. Now this wig, the reason why we ordered this full lace wig, this is not a wig that I, that I made myself but this is a full lace wig. The whole entire thing from the back to the front is full lace, okay? The reason why we ordered full lace for that shoot is because we knew that we were gonna wanna do a super short cut and you have more versatility with a, with a full lace wig. Now this wig, again, this is a full lace wig, but this is also going to be a full lace wig. And the difference is this is this one right here, was manufactured and this one will be made from scratch from start to finish, all right? Then you have your lace closure wig. This right here is a lace closure wig. So this top part right here, you see this, this lace? Now this is what I was talking about in terms of lace. You can look at this lace and tell a big difference from this lace right here. With this lace on this bespoke piece, you can't even see the lace. That's an H, this is actually a film lace, that's not an HD lace. And on this lace right here, this lace is so thick and it has like a gray hue to it. I would not in real life use a piece like this or use a piece of lace like this um, for a client or even for something that I'm selling on my website. But this is a lace closure wig. so all the way around are going to be wefts. And you see how it has that hard, harsh line right there? That is because there's no lace over here to disguise any of that. And right here, just in this little area right up here at the top is the lace closure, okay? This is also, now that's a manufactured piece, but this is a semi-custom piece right here. Semi-custom because my daughter, is the one who who has and this wig is not finished yet. We still have to do some hairline work to this piece. But my daughter has has hand tied all of the knots right here in this top part section. So you see the difference between this piece and this piece. These knots are manufactured and these knots are not over here. My daughter hand tied this piece. Even on the screen, you can see a huge difference. Right, right. It's a big difference, big difference. And she, so what she did with that particular piece, this particular piece actually, um, she hand tied it in a center part and then we're going down because there's only a small bit of um, lace that we're gonna cover up this little section right here on. We're in, probably gonna end up using this wig. Uh, it's gonna be colored and it's gonna be used for another photo shoot. But the difference is, it's incredible. You can't even, once this wig is done and it's gonna be put, uh, going to be adhered, you cannot tell you won't be able to tell the difference, even though that's not the best lace ever. It's still a great piece of lace. But you see, the possibilities are endless when it comes to working with wigs. 
Okay, the next type of manufactured or mass produced wig is your U part wig. Now, a U part wig doesn't have lace on it anywhere, but it's also not a hard front wig because with a U part wig, it's literally what it says it is. It's basically like a closure wig, but without the closure. So your hair is used to close the wig. So your hair is blended with the wig and it leaves that open area out. They'll, those types of wigs are great. In fact, one of my favorite wigs that I like to wear is a U-part wig. Okay, to, so to adhere your U-part wigs, um, you would either sew them down around the perimeter or you can clip them in with combs. Okay. And then the other type of wig is a lace front wig. And I talked about that earlier with this one right here. This is actually a lace front wig where the lace is all around from here. Where is my finger? From here to here. All right. That's a lace front wig. And then you have um, toppers. Okay. This is a topper for, it can either be used for a man or a woman, but typically uh, this is going to be used for a man. And the reason why it's called a topper is because it's designed to go right here on the top of the head. These can be custom as well. And then the last thing, this right here is a lace. This is what I call a lace top wig. So this wig is actually a bob and it has bangs right? But the top part is lace. So only this section here is lace. The reason why I like these wigs so much, if you're going to have a client that's wearing bangs and you're not going to want to ventilate the whole part in the top, you can just do a crown whirl. You can ventilate that crown whirl in the top and it's going to look so realistic and so amazing. And guess what? You didn't have to spend hours making a full lace wig. You can just do a small section of hair. All right. And I think that's all in terms of the custom pieces that I have. This is a lace. This is a lace closure. Um, I'm sorry, not a closure. This is a lace frontal. This is actually a really big frontal. It looks more like a half wig, but sometimes you'll have clients that have a lot of hair in the back and maybe even a little bit on the sides and they don't need a full lace wig. Hmm. Back in the day, this was called a transformation or semi-transformation. That's what they used to call this um, way, way back in the day when wig making first started. And the last thing I have is just a hand tie closure piece. So we're working right now for another shoot on a 32 inch um, Indian curly wig. And so, I have my daughter hand tie this closure piece right here. And so we're not done. She still has the hairline area to do, but this has been fully hand tied by my 16 year old daughter. She does a lot of wig work for, uh, for the company. So anybody can learn this skill working with wigs. I'm surrounded by wigs right now, uh, <laughs> working with wigs is so much fun. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do in terms of wigs. Um, so last thing I'm going to be talking about is uh, working with insurance companies and wigs. But I saw Andrew pop in once. Andrew, do you have a question for me? There was just one one question that Neil had that I think is actually kind of an interesting question when you're doing sure. these. Do you wear like a magnifying or do you have like oh a magnifying God. glass or jeweler's loop or something like that? Seems like yeah. it's a tiny detail work. Yes. So I, my daughter has young eyes, so she doesn't have to wear anything, but I have glasses that are prescribed. I call them my wig making glasses. So I went to the, um, the eye doctor and I told him, I said, Hey, I do this intricate work with wigs and I have to look at these tiny little holes all day. And I have a pres prescription specifically for, uh, making wigs, but typically people will use, um, readers. So readers will work anything that magnifies the lace so that you can see the holes. Um, some people use the little headlamps with the uh, magnifier on it. Um, there's mul multiple different things that different people use, but I am one of those. I have seasoned eyes. That's what I'll say. My eyes are very seasoned. So I have to have something that helps me to see the lace better because the holes are pretty, pretty small. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is working with insurance companies. A lot of people don't know that you can work with insurance companies um, 
I'm just going to move some of these wigs. That you can work with insurance companies to get your clients taken care of in terms of wigs. And that starts with the individual. The first thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that their insurance covers them getting a hairpiece. And that's just going to come down to them going over their policy. Sometimes that may mean that they have to call, um, they have to call their either their insurance company or you know whatever person they're working with in terms of insurance. And people don't realize that those things are really written into policy. Um, it's typically called, it will never be called a wig. It will always be, almost always be called a cranial prosthesis. And it's considered a prosthetic. A wig is considered, a wig or topper is considered a prosthetic. Um, there are some insurance companies, um, and well, yeah, I'll say it that way. There are some insurance companies that can pay up to, $5,000 per year per wig for clients. Now, that is an amazing, <laughs> that's amazing if somebody's insurance will pay that much. But I will say this, not all insurance companies will pay that much. Some are at $1,500, uh, some are as low as $300. But the importance of that is understanding the different types of wigs and when to use them so that if you do have a client that suffers from permanent hair loss, that needs a piece that may not necessarily be able to afford a bespoke piece from you to be able to have the skill to know how to. OK, so this person can't afford this particular type of wig, but I can make a semi custom piece. I can do something like. I could do something like this and just remove the hair in an area and semi-customize a piece so that my client can still have a nice wig and doesn't have to pay a lot of money for it. So it's important to know what you're getting at prior to. Now, when you're working with insurance companies, um, it's important that you understand a little bit of how the coding goes. There will, may be times where um, you have to go over the information and go over the paperwork and make sure everything is on point. And there's particular codes that they use to order the cranial prosthesis. It has to be prescribed by the doctor. So they will, the doctor will, will literally write a prescription for a cranial prosthesis. Um, and it's a, it's a, the process is slightly different depending on the insurance company, but in most cases, um, it's as simple as them writing the prescription and making sure that the medical billing is in place and submitting the information for the insurance company to pay for the piece. However, in most cases, there's going to be a delay in you getting your money from the insurance company. So the way that typically works is you can either take a deposit from your client or you can just wait until the insurance company pays. But that may take a very long time. So just be mindful of that. Um, it is a process that can take a long time. But once you do it once, then you'll understand the process. And even depending on if when you're working with different insurance companies, because every insurance company is different, but even after you get the process down once, you'll pretty much have an idea of how to do it each time. Do you find that quite a few clients don't know that they can uh, yeah. get it, yeah. get insurance? Yeah, they don't, they don't even know if it's covered. They didn't even know that it was a thing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times at doctor's offices, they'll have a good bit of knowledge depending on, like if it's an um, oncology center, of course, they're going to have knowledge, um, more knowledge than normal. And dermatologists, even some dermatologists that deal with uh, patients that have alopecia mm -hmm. will know a little bit, but um, a lot of times clients don't even know that they their insurance company will cover a hairpiece because nobody even thinks about that. But a hairpiece is considered a prosthetic. So if you're in the military, because I'm a I'm a vet, I get my health care at the VA. If you're getting a wig from the VA, they send you to the prosthetic center. They'll send you there because it's considered a prosthetic and people don't realize that. So they completely, they don't even think about it. Oh, I lost my hair. I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to buy a wig. 
when in most cases your insurance company will cover it. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's one of those things that um, it's like a hidden gem. And I hate that it's hidden because a lot of people don't know. And the other thing that a lot of people don't know either, and I was sharing this with you before we uh, mm -hmm. got on here, Andrew, is that some cancer centers have a stylist that is positioned inside the cancer center mm -hmm. to help people, to help the cancer patients with wigs. The only thing that the only thing with that, the only issue that I have with that is typically. So the one that my mom uh, went to, they did not have not one wig to fit an African-American woman. Really? She would have had to wear a silk, like a silky textured hair for a wig because they didn't have anything that fit an African-American woman. That's the only caveat to that is having someone who is even educated in that area and knowing um, that not every texture works for everybody and <laughs> understanding that um, there's different, there's different types of wigs. And so making sure that um, even as stylists, that's important. It's an important part. In my opinion, being a stylist is understanding um, how and where to source these things. If it's some, an area that you're going to be working in. Gotcha. As, as a hairdresser, there's not necessarily like a specific certification you have to have to be considered like a wig maker or receive insurance payments, correct? No, that is correct. You don't have to have a specific certification or anything like that. Um, you can uh, there you can get your NPI number that makes things a little bit more easier when working with insurance companies. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in like Nancy P is in Paul I is in Igloo. Um, okay. It's a pretty simple process to go through to get your NPI number. Um, some insurance companies will require that you have an MP NPI number when working with them. And it's just a number that assigns that the NPI website will assign to a specific stylist to be able to um, bill insurance companies and work with the insurance companies. But sometimes they don't even require that you have that NPI number, but some insurance companies do. Awesome. This is, I mean, we just spent an hour and I, I, I almost want to just keep going because I'm so incredibly fascinated. And like you should have seen that how uh, typically like on our shows, there'll be kind of a bump of watchers in the beginning, then it'll start to like kind of, you know, come down a little bit. And then towards the end, it starts to fall off this whole time. Uh, I think people have just been so interested as they <laughs> pop on. It's just been going up and up and up. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a, lot, it's a lot of fun talking about wigs because there's so many different things that you can do with just the skill. So I had a, a, a young man years ago come attend one of my hands on events and he sent me a picture a couple months later and he said, I, I work with brides. He, he was an editorial stylist for a bride magazine and he sent me pictures of these little volumizer pieces that he made. They were maybe that big. And he made clips in them and was able to clip them in particular areas for his bridal shoots. And they looked amazing. So a lot of people think when they think wigs or wig making or uh, ventilating, that it's just for full pieces. But the possibilities are endless with this skill. You can do so many different things with hair pieces and working with wigs in multiple different different areas of the industry. So it's a lot of fun. I can talk about wigs all day long. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's so cool. Um, guys, there, there is so much information that Marquetta and her husband, Ricky, share so freely through their social. So please go follow her on Instagram at Marquetta Breslin. Are you on Facebook too, Marquetta? Yes. Yep. I'm okay. Probably same thing, Marquetta Breslin. Yep. And of course, you have her website. You just got a little taste of what she had to offer. Like she is such an incredible educator. I think you got a taste of that. So if you are interested in wigs at all, and she also has a full social media program too, how to be great at social media. So they are doing great things for our industry. Please, please, please go give her a follow. And she is fantastic at getting back to people through her comments on her website and through her social. So um, if you have questions for her, please reach out. Thank you again for having me. I've had a blast. 
Anytime you guys need me to come back and talk about wigs, I'm game. Just say the word. <laughs> Watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you, Marquetta. It's so great to have you. You're welcome. All right, y'all. I hope you had as good of a time as we did because that was freaking awesome. I don't even do wigs and I'm completely fascinated by this. So I hope you had a great time today. Hopefully we will see you back here tomorrow for Wellness Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern with our friend Blake Reed Evans to talk about how to get socially savvy. And of course, the education will continue. We'll see you in the future. Thanks, y'all. Take care.